Hey everybody. So this evening we're going to do a deep subject. <clears throat> we're going to hit one of my favorites. Uh, this is a topic that got me motivated into geology back in the 70s when we had the San Fernando quake version 1. <clears throat> version 2 hit later in the 90s. But uh, back in the 60s, late 60s, we had a pretty good quake in the San Fernando Valley and it motivated me to get all fired up about studying earthquakes and a little bit about offshore physics and stuff like that having to do with oceanography and that's how I got into this whole geophysics thing in the first place. I went to UCSD and studied at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, that's a mouthful, and learned a lot about geophysics and I'm kind of sparing you guys the heavy duty parts of that but the details are helpful in understanding where gold hides. <clears throat> so tonight I thought we'd spend a little time talking about different types of quake faults, just kind of a high level version, and in particular the kind that affect the area that you'll be looking for gold in, because it's instructive to understand how faults relate to gold. It's instructive to understand what faults look like so that you can identify them in the field. And it's helpful to understand them from the point of view of you know what they do and how they affect er erosion, how they affect the uplifting of mountains and that whole thing don't have time enough to cover all that stuff so we're just going to touch on a few of them and then we're going to kind of do that over uh, a longer period of time as we talk about rocks geology and that kind of stuff but tonight we're just going to talk a little bit about a geologic phenomena called a fault and what that is so let me check on our usual and make sure that i am live and you're hearing me so if you can chime in right now i'm going to be checking in and that way we'll sync up in parallel. <clears> Throat's <throat> giving me a little bit of whatnot with all of this uh, pollen out there. <laughs> Fancy that. Rain leads to pollen. So, uh, let's see. I see that we're live. I see there's people on. I see there's comments. Let's check what you have to say to me. Justin says, hi everyone. Charles is telling me the sound is good. That's great. Justin went out today and did some test panning and found a tiny bit of gold. Good. Good. Tiny bit leads to a tiny bit more. Uh, the question you want to understand is what what is it you found and where why did you find it there? And then you're going to work your way toward more of it. That's the whole idea and how we help you find more gold. So let me see. Our sound is good. Everything's going. I can see that I'm live on the on the Facebookus, uh, and so uh, make sure you check that out on YouTube as well later for the re, re uh, the rebroadcast uh, here on Facebook. You can kind of do a search, or you can go over onto my YouTube channel, Prospector Jess. Uh, this I am Prospector Jess at sourdoughminer.com. Just in case you don't know me, uh, a lot of you do. Um, make sure you also check out the. Uh, Tonight we're sponsored by 2020, which is how to get gold vision and see where gold goes in a, in a flood or a flow. The reason why I chose 2020 in this particular aspect is the relationship to faults and faulting and how uh, the erosion of water flowing through those canyons that have been faulted is affected by that softened material. When it cracks and opens up in a fault, it also leads to an erosional spot that will form canyons. We'll see that in a minute. And so... Uh, I just want to bring that up as a topic. That's something to go check out on sourdoughminer.com slash 20 hyphen 20. And you can look at that report. Uh, it's relatively cheap and you can understand a little bit more about what water does to move gold. So I opened this with a volley from the USGS uh, uh, site on earthquakes and, and specifically uh, San Fernando and well, not San Fernando, Southern California. These red lines are historic quakes. These are quakes that have happened in the last roughly century uh, from 1850 until 2016, the way they did this map. But you can see there's a lot of activity in the Southern California area. That's why we're kind of earthquake central for a lot of things. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that that doesn't mean beans when it comes to gold and its effect. What actually makes a big difference is look closely at these, these what look like crack lines or fissures all over the Southern California and the desert area here. You can see this huge number of, of 
you know, spots. Let me let me zoom in a little bit more. It's going to go crazy here. Always does. I make these things go crazy. So, so looking at these gray areas, each one of these is an individual fault that's been identified, and it doesn't include the ones they haven't identified. Those are the ones you're going to be looking for because these are typically large faults. And large faults have subsystems that crack all over the place near them and can affect the the outcome when it comes to understanding gold and you know erosion and things like that that affect the deposit of gold uh, also it affects if they're deep enough faults like this one along the san andreas and you start getting hydrothermal effects like the stuff you get down in the san jacinto area and the stuff you get on the back side of the sierra with this whole series there's another fault zone that's now developing some new news and that is it's not really surprising but the sierra nevada is really you know uplifted by faulting uh, it would not be a surprise that that faulting leads to some pretty substantial you know movement of earth and hence you have one of the largest zones for gold depositing in the world and richest zones. And part of that's because the faults expose the lower strata so that they can be eroded out and they contain, they also expose a crack for potential intrusion or injection of, of gold loaded material. So there's sort of a multiple effort here with the fault. What we wanna talk about is that these guys go along these major mountain ranges and just because they haven't identified that as a really important zone uh, some of this is political history having to do with the proximity of the san andreas to populated areas the fact of the matter is one of the largest faults in in the continental u.s runs right up the back side of the sierra nevada up near inyo Kern and on north and so what happens is that fault may unleash something much bigger than they ever expected. And they're just now starting to see some interesting history, prehistory about that. Um, stay tuned for more on that front. But the reason why I bring it up is that all these cracks amount to a couple of areas that you should be interested in. One is a concept called a strike slip fault. That's where the fault moves horizontally. The others are actually a normal fault, which means they, the fault moves along a plane into the earth. That's typically the kind that will cause injections to kind of flow into them, but so will a strike slip fault. Um, there's also another kind of fault, another pair of them. One, uh, one's called a horst, and one's called a graben. You've heard of me talk about it. The desert is full of horst and graben type faults where you get uplifted chunks and they drop chunks. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute here. And I'm going to do a little drawing just for fun. Try to make it all simple. But the objective is to just get your head wrapped around the idea that faults and gold go together. Like volcanoes and gold go together. See the pattern? So these faults are surrounding the ring of fire where there's plate subduction. The plate subduction causes stresses that causes the earthquakes and the faulting and that in turn allows a release of of intrusive material through volcanic action that can bring up both uh, volcanic or magmatic movement which can move gold bearing ores into position where they cool off below the surface it can also push this stuff out on the top if it has a lot of basalt the gold's going to be, going to be so disseminated it'll be very very you know sparse but if it comes in as a secondary hydrothermal injection through some of this fault zone, now we get into this kind of area where, oh, look, there's all this orogenic, they call it, that's earth movement, and all of this, this secondary hydrothermal activity that peels out all the sulfides and, and the acids etch out the, the metals, and then they later on get, get hit with a change in pH or a change in stress in an earthquake and they start to plate out and when they plate out that's where you get your metallic uh, metalliferous ores where you actually see the crystal and gold appear now remember the gold can be there in the other ores as well it just won't necessarily show up in what we call nuggets or or crystals and, and load with with electrum and things like that the fun stuff but it may be still very valuable so just keep that in mind as you're thinking prospecting so earthquakes are really important to understand in this context and that's why i'm going to go over it tonight so let's take a look and i'll go to my uh my blackboard gold prospecting and fault zones so what i thought i would start off with is a simple model 
first level is looking at something we would call a strike slip fault. And that looks something like this, where there's you know two planes of action where we have you know chunks of land that are effectively moving relative to one another. So this one's moving to the to the upper left and this one's moving to the lower right relative to the other block of land. Underneath there are layers of material and these layers kind of run parallel to each other from the surface but they don't necessarily run parallel on on the surface and here's what ends up you find when you look for gold and stuff like that. You might find a stream that is flowing out of the mountains and down through this and all of a sudden it goes and it reappears over here. Now what's happened here is it shifted down this way. Really made a mess out of that. But the objective is it's it's actually moving more abruptly, it moves right parallel to the fault. So it's kind of a, you know, a, a jog in the creek. That jog may be several hundred yards to miles long. The other thing that happens is that gold, I mean that gold, that fault, where it moves, it scrapes. That scraping action and crushing of the rocks and minerals inside of it, and the deeper you go, the crushing effect turns into a more polishing effect and can actually turn into heat which causes a remelting. That's where you get things like uh, you get olivine and so forth coming out of out of basalts and turning into combining with water underground and turning into your serpentines, greenstones and stuff like that. And so what ends up happening is these these faults move along crunch. And as they do, the surface area, it crushes that material up. And guess what happens when you crush hard, dense rock? It turns and pulverizes into very thin, easily removed, softened material, which ends up getting gouged out by the nearest stream. And so the stream deepens and pulls out material that might be buried in there like gold load and things like that. And so this is a, part of why it's of interest to you is that these faults affect and distort the activity around where water flows that in turn can cause a concentration of material that may have come from deep in the earth, but now is exposed by the faulting activity, depending upon whether it's this kind of fault, which is a, which is a largely sur surface, surface fault, okay? Or the second kind that's similar to it, but different. And that is what we call a normal fault. A normal fault, on the other hand, is a block that moves relative to another block in, a, in an angle, you know, so it moves on a slope. I'm not drawing this right. Eh, not so bad though. Okay, and so what's happened here is the, the, instead of moving horizontally, this thing has moved vertically, slid down a slope. And so this is A, and this is B. Whereas this would be A up here, and this would be B up here. This is this is what's typically going on with the San Andreas fault. So when we look at this picture ahead on the title page, this fault is your classic uh, strike slip. Okay, so it's moving along, and, and and the joke is that Los Angeles will be along San Francisco in a couple of thousand years. You know, it's that kind of thing. But it's going to take a long time. <laughs> You can buy real estate all the way along and some of it will turn to beach, some of it won't. The joke has always been that it's all going to turn to beach and that's not true. It's just going to keep cruising to Alaska where it'll freeze over. Another story. Um, so that's, that's that kind of picture. Let me go back to our, our blackboard. So, so we had that, that strike slip fault and we had that essentially the, the vertical drop. It shows up in our, doing a really crummy job of this, but you get the idea. So A and B. 
and this was our our normal fault okay I don't know why they call it normal because it's not moving normally <laughs> but it, you know it's it's this vertical motion which is normal to the surface is the thought normal means perpendicular uh, but this thing isn't necessarily moving perpendicular. It could be moving at any angle to the earth. And that's important to you because that fault may not go steep. It may go very shallow. In fact, one that goes sh extremely shallow is called a thrust fault. It can be a blind thrust, in which case it shows up. It doesn't show on the surface at all. Or it can be a thrust fault where it shows on the surface and creates an opportunity for you because it would be a place where the water would gouge out one side and down deep. On the other side, it wouldn't be so deep. Or if you're in a load zone, it affects, you know, these affect the roof and the ceiling of the load ore. That's, that's kind of the key thing here is this kind of activity plays a role in any kind of gold prospecting. It can be placer or load. Um, and so this normal fault is an important type of faulting and, and plays a role in how things deposit. Again, it has these layers like we talked about. It'll be kind of like, you know, this will be one set of layers and then the equivalent set of layers will have slid down further and be down here somewhere. And, and if you came out here, you'd see this exposed layer right here. And let's say this layer has your gold in it, right? This, this chunk right here where we're marking with railroad tracks, okay? And so the idea is that, that layer is exposed on the top one, A block. B block, it's buried down deep. If A block showed you there was gold and it was up so many hundred or thousand feet from B, then you know how many hundred or thousand feet down below the surface X marks the spot that you might find some load buried down beneath. And that's where you'd start doing some diamond drilling to you know prove out the rest of the structure. Because this structure was interrupted by the fault, but that doesn't mean that this, this gold bearing zone doesn't exist. In fact, it's a hint that it does. So that's the kind of thing you're looking for when you're looking for faults. It's a displacement in the layers of the earth caused by stresses or forces on the surface of the earth. And the thing cracks and then moves and that cracking and movement follows a certain pattern. It's kind of like following the cracks on a window glass when it shatters, you know, looks like random, but it's really not. It follows a certain stress pattern depending upon how the impact happened and where the stress is coming from. So does that make sense everybody? I get, am I losing you already? I hope not. Uh, sound is good. Went out today. Let's see. Uh, always look forward to the tips found in the black sand. Okay. Uh, most times I miss it here in Australia. Good, Steve. Glad you made it. <laughs> the Australians are in. Okay. And Charles Trout is here in California. And yes, you do have lots of faulting in California. Now, here's the fun part. California is not the only place that has faulting. In fact, they're now issuing warnings on the East Coast because there's faulting offshore in the east coast area and some onshore that could have serious impact on those tall skyscrapers that are not necessarily bedded on solid rock like they should be so it's one of those things that you know we tend to take for granted out here in the west that we have quakes and back east they don't it isn't always true a quake's a quake and faulting is faulting um, so that's this part now let's let's erase this board again and now I'm going to talk about the other two faults we were going to talk about tonight. One is essentially a horse fault. You can think of it as a, a fault that was formed by uh, rising and falling blocks of material. Okay. And so this is a horse fault. I don't know why they come up with the term horse, but we used to always think of it as this is like a horsey saddle. <laughs> Oh, you come up with nutty, nutty things to talk about in class. So, and let's say this block had that, remember our railroad track chunk, which shows us our horizontal layers. So there's our railroad track and it's been interrupted and it's down here on this side. And it's down here on this side. And then this stuff goes on infinitely deep into the earth. And so that's a horse. And, and that's important because these, these structures exist all over in the desert. 
the mountain and basin ranges that you find out in the desert and many of the ones that are in the Rockies and the subsections of the Rockies. This is the kind of stuff you see. Now, what you, what you don't know is that this kind of stuff used to exist on the East Coast and it's since been eroded away. And so what you see in the gold belt in the Appalachians is kind of leftovers of this kind of activity. It's not there now. What's there now is sort of this thing smeared out. It's been, it's been eroded down and there's a lot of layers of material, a lot of metamorphic stuff and things. But these kinds of, you know, upswing, downswing, uplifting, downlifting, falling chunks create the environment in which there's a lot of metamorphic rock formed. And that's where a lot of that stuff from the East Coast comes from. Now, the second one that exists is kind of novel and is a little different looking. Same principle, uh, but working a little differently. And that is, there is another type of fault that goes something like this, where, where this block kind of wedges downward. And because there's so much, so much drop and so forth, again, this is called a grabbing. And what this guy does is it's a downturn version of the horse, but it has a little bit different property in that you can see quickly what we're talking about here is a, a layer here that's highly subject to erosion. It also has all of this material feeding into it. Hint, hint, Placer Gold City. And so if you were in the desert, the places you'd end up wanting to look for would be something not so much on those high plateaus as at these joints in between. I'm going to draw it yellow here. And that is this whole region in here and the backside over here. And in this case, this region down in here and some of the stuff down below and this region over in here and some of the stuff down below, because all that material is going to start going down into those areas. It will come out of here. So if you found some, then then you you might ask yourself, is there a is there a region in here that yields a lot of what I'm finding and it disappeared, and so I can start doing a load hunt. And we talked about that in other videos. Okay, so once you once you identify a placer deposit that has concentrations nearby some of this kind of horst and grab and faulting activity then you start looking up at the regions above you and looking for those layers, specifically the rocks and minerals associated with gold. Then you go to the layers using your same sampling techniques to hunt down where the gold cuts out. Once you find where it cuts out, you back up a little bit and you look closely at the actual rocks and minerals. That's how you find a load. And so it's one of those things where, you know, you sleuth it out by looking for the specifics, but first you look for the big things. And that would be these deposits that are at the bottom of these areas that have faulted and it's done a lot of the lifting, the heavy lifting of that material. Because remember, the stuff was thousands of feet, maybe miles deep before it got lifted up. And now it's up there getting exposed to all that weather because the higher it goes, the more weather takes it out because the weather, you know, the clouds deposit more at higher altitudes. And so now pretty soon what you end up with is this terrific opportunity that you've got that someone else has been digging. You know, God put all those clouds up there for you to dig your gold out for you. So you just take advantage of what you can and, and go after those rocks and minerals that are exposed, but starting off with a little knowledge about what faults do to expose them. Does that make sense? And again, going back to the 2020 thing I talked about earlier, you know, we're, we're looking at these faults, but the 2020 idea is how does the fault play a role in all this? And the answer is it provides a conduit for the water to erode that material. Once it erodes and concentrates it, now you've got a starting point to start working your claim and heading toward where that stuff sourced. Where did the, where did the fault expose it? And then once you get to that point, then the mad chase begins. And at that point you sell your, <laughs> you sell your claim to somebody who really has got the equipment or interest, but you get the idea. It's, it's a lot of fun just starting out that way. Okay. Uh, uh, if it's a valuable claim, you probably don't want to sell it, but you know, it just depends on the regulations and all that junk. So, but the fact is it's still a great hunt. So does that make sense? Everybody, I got you still. 
Bagby Serpentine Fault Wine in Mariposa. The Serpentine was uplisted, uplifted in slate. Exactly. So here you go. You got the Serpentine Chunk being uplifted. It itself was formed in the process of faulting and uplifting. Combined with slate, which is also a metamorphic rock, and it's combined with the faulting and uplifting, both of which have concentrations of gold in them, and they reconcentrate if there's hydrothermal activity associated with all that faulting, and boom, you got yourself the Bagby concentrations, and you can see that in uh, you can see that in a, a lot of that area. There's a lot of gold mines all throughout the Bagby section. That's up up from uh, uh, Lake uh, McClure, I think. I lose track and I should know better. Um, anyway, uh, Clarence Smith says, hello. So, uh, you got all of this in California, but like I say, you, you know, there's nothing peculiar about California in this other than this particular thing I chose to use in, as an example was a, was a, a report by the USGS about, you know, California fault zones. But you can see this whole subsec subduction zone goes all along the coast, uh, goes up into Canada, into Alaska, goes over into Russia, you know, you name it. Uh, this stuff is everywhere. It just happens to be that the most, probably the most studied fault on planet Earth is the San Andreas. So it's convenient to give you the example. Don't get, don't get disappointed or distracted by it as an example. Those faults and that type of fault exist all over this place. So... Just be aware of that. You see this thing going down into Mexico and opening up the, the East Pacific rise and, and the uh, Baja Peninsula. Uh, that That's all part of that same dynamic that's going on. So I, I don't want to get too far off track here. Uh, and uh, let's see, <laughs> but I managed to. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's probably it for tonight. I just wanted to touch bases with you on it. Um, go back to the good old rock pictures uh <laughs> so for now uh the ring of fire and all manner of faulting uh it goes beyond just the ring of fire which is more typically thought of as the pacific ring of fire there's also an atlantic ring you can you look at iceland you know and um and look at the whole caribbean it's full of faults and volcanoes and so and so everywhere you have these plates opening up and moving moving the continents apart and they crash into each other you're going to get this kind of stuff you look at india and uh you look at pakistan and and uh afghanistan loaded with mineral wealth and gold is one of those things but they've got platinum they've got tourmaline they got diamonds they got rubies they got sapphires they got corundum you know you name it it's up there so um and south america same thing so it, it's just it's always interesting to kind of look around you and ask yourself, what do I see? Do I see a fault? Learn to recognize those two, three, four patterns there. Not, I give you four patterns. Recognize what they look like. Recognize what they look like in Google Earth. You might do some Googling tonight just for fun and go look up faults near you and see if you can spot them from the sky. Once you spot them from the sky, learn to see that pattern of a normal fault, a strike slip fault, a, a, a Horst and Graben kind of structure. Then when you go to the field, you'll know you're looking at something that has this faulting characteristic. If you look at the geologic formations around you, you can understand the patterns of what you're looking for. Faulting is a big one. Volcanism is a big one. Water flow, big one. So these all play a role in your being able to discern where the gold is and where it moved to. Now you know where not to look and where to look. And that's why we're here, helping you find more gold. Prospector Jess, hunting for gold, over and out for tonight. Good prospecting. <laughs>